Hudson for our church. Um, just a few things to highlight for you. One being um, that next Sunday we will be gathering for worship outside. Okay, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, but also the Saturday before at 6 o'clock. So this event we're calling I Agree with Jonathan. And why are we calling it I Agree with Jonathan? Because we wanted something for people to talk about. I mean, that was really it. We, you know, we agree with John. We agree with the gospel message that he's going to share. And we want other people to hear that. And so it's, it really is a conversation piece. So invite somebody to come and to be here next week. Come to Sunday school. If you want to park your cars over here, we're going to be on the, the bottom side of the prayer garden. The stage is going to be on the edge of the prayer garden. And if you want to bring a chair, you can do that. You can bring a chair and sit in the grassy knoll that's right here um, on this side of the building. But we're, we're, gathered, uh, we're going to be gathering outside. Now, Saturday is important because we're going to have a big prayer meeting. And Jonathan will be here for the prayer meeting, but he's not going to be preaching. He's going to be praying because we're praying for revival and spiritual awakening. My dad's going to be there. He's going to sing a few songs for us. And, and our goal next Saturday night for the tailgate prayer meeting at 6 o'clock is to fellowship, is to pray and ask God for revival in our lives and our church and our community. So be here next week um, uh, for both of those things. They're going to be cooking some hot dogs out there next week. So kind of be prepared for that. Um, if you would like to have a hot dog, you can. But if you're not a hot dog fan and you want to bring a McDonald's cheeseburger, you can do that too. Um, no, oh, and we need to celebrate today. Did you know that we've reached our North Carolina missions goal? Yay! Uh, thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, Matt, can you put that slide up there for me? Uh, I think maybe, there you go. We have, we have reached, that doesn't mean you can't continue to give, because whatever you give, we're going to continue to give it towards North Carolina missions. Um, but thank you for your faithfulness and for your stewardship in that area. Um, and then in the back, uh, you, there's a book. And I've handed a few of these out. These things are free. We want you to get one. We want you to get one and read it. It's a nice, easy read, small chapters, reading one a night. But you can also grab one and give it to your neighbor and ask them to read it with you. What a witness that could be. Hey, would you like to read this? And I'll read it. And then maybe we can get together every now and again and talk about it. Um, there's also some invitation cards for our time together next Sunday. Um, it's an exciting week to be a part of First Baptist Church. It's First Baptist. Lillington Baptist Church. And I'm glad that you're here tonight. Today. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together in your name to worship you. We know our gathering is important because your word tells us not to neglect meeting together. Oh, God, we ask that you would continue to shape us to look more and more like Jesus and that you would help the desires of our hearts to line up with yours. Your heart breaks for those who don't know you. And I pray that you would give us compassion and a sense of urgency to share you, the God of hope, the light of the world, with those who are living without you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you for equipping us to be a part of your kingdom work. Lord, we lift up the needs of our friends and loved ones that are fresh on our hearts. Help us to watch in hope for you, to wait for you, God, our Savior. We know you hear us. We know your will will not be thwarted, and we know that your word will accomplish the purpose for which you send it. When you say it, help us believe it, because it is done. Thank you for being such a good father. We love you and praise you. And thank you for who you are and all you do and will continue to do. And we pray all this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
morning. Um, of course, it is so good to gather and worship together. Uh, Bill and I were playing a mock choir this morning. We were pretending to be the entire choir for a few minutes this morning. We looked at one another and said, our lives should always be an instrument for God's glory. Uh, and then Bill said to me, did you know that everyone in heaven will be singing? And I was like, Yes, even those of us who are more nervous about our voices. I am so thankful to gather in a place of worship with you today. If you're gathering with us online, thanks for gathering with us. We're glad that you're here. Uh, you might want to take a moment and hit the like party button, or the, excuse me, the watch party button or the like button. Um, and uh, because we believe that God's doing something special among us. And we're going to put a word on that special thing. And what we're praying for is a sense of revival where God will refresh our hearts, refresh our spirits, and do something spiritually new among us. Because now's the time. Now's the time for that to happen inside of us. If you have your Bibles, again, Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1 is where we're going to be today. Um, have you uh, ever heard the story, The Three Little Pigs? You remember the little three little pigs? You remember they built three types of houses. Let's take a poll. Who remembers what those three houses were made of? Straw, sticks, and bricks. And then there was the antagonist in the story, the big bad wolf. And the wolf wanted to come and blow the houses down. He comes up uh, uh, to the, the first house and said, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll, I'll blow your house down. And what, what was the pig's statement in there? Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. But what happened to the house of straw? Which is supposed to teach us a lesson that we need to be careful about what we build our houses out of. Now, yes, our physical houses, but our spiritual houses, too. He comes up to the house of sticks and says, you know, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. And what happens to the house of sticks? Two houses down. Now, the last house with bricks comes up and he huffs and he puffs and he can't blow the house of bricks down. So when the storms of life are blowing, when the enemy, when, when the devil and his, his evil side of this conflict is in struggle against us, it's important that we ask, 
what is our spiritual house made of? What, 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 is our, what, are, what are our hearts made of? And, and when it comes that day, when the winds are blowing and it's howling, I hope, I hope that our spiritual houses are made of strong things. Strong things that stand the test of time. But it would make us ask the question today, do our houses need a little bit of work? Do, do our spiritual houses need a little bit of work? Have they become a little bit dry like straw or a little bit brittle like twigs? We want them to be strong with strong foundations. And with that in mind, we're going to go into Nehemiah with what is the state of our spiritual houses? And we're going to read the entire chapter together. Can we do something new today or something different? Can we all stand for the reading of God's Word together? And, and please, you have your copy of God's Word. I encourage you to follow along with me. I'll be reading out of the New International Version. The words of Nehemiah, son of ha excuse me, Hakaliah. In the month of Keslev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, and Important prayer. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who have made who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer that your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel, I confess the sins we Israelites including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave yourself, your servant Moses, saying, if you are faithful, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today. By granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. Heavenly Father, we pray that your word would bring forth fruit in our life. Fruit that is easy to pick. And that we might walk out of this space refreshed. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Um, so, this is from the prophet Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah is the, the second prophet to go about a huge task for the people of Israel. Um, if, we, if we remember, um, David becomes king of Israel a long time before Nehemiah. David becomes king of Israel. He unites these Jewish people together, um, and, and he rules from Jerusalem, which is, you know, this walled city um, for about 10 years. Uh, maybe a, you know, a little more, a little less. His son takes over after that. His son's name was Solomon. After Solomon, the nation of Israel is divided between the northern and the southern kingdom. Judah, as they were called, and Israel. Uh, their division uh, further led to intermarrying um, with, with neighboring nations. It led to bringing pagan worship inside the nation of Israel. When I say pagan worship... Israel is supposed to worship one God, Yahweh. And they started worshiping other gods. Not only did they start worshiping those other gods, they started bringing the worship of those other gods into the temple of Israel. And so God allowed the nation of Israel to be conquered 
by an enemy. Then they came in, they conquered Israel, they drove them out into three different waves of exile. And while they were gone, the nation, the people that were left in Israel um, were, well, they were dispersed. The people that were left and that were not taken, those that were taken were mainly the nobles. Because if you're an enemy and you want to control a group of people, it would be a wise idea to enslave and take back all the royalty, all the noble people, so that the regular people didn't have anybody to rule them. The people that are left became in Israel known as the diaspora. The diaspora like scattered ones, the left behind ones. They intermarried with excuse me, those uh, neighboring nations. They, they started worshiping other gods. And the, the nation of Israel crumbles. The nation of Israel crumbles. Um, the, the spiritual decay that goes on. The physical decay of the temple and of the city gates is occurring. Then the prophet Ezra asks for permission to come back and start to rebuild. So he does. He gets permission to come back from his captors uh, uh, to Israel and rebuild. And, but they don't complete the process. They, they don't complete the process. They, they get a ways into it and stop. And so now we pick up with the prophet Nehemiah. Um, Nehemiah uh, is, is like Ezra's contemporary. And even though there was a group left behind uh, uh, in, in Israel, there is still the possibility that God might revive the nation. Even though those people that lived in Israel were doing pagan things, there's still the possibility that God might do something incredible in a dry and weary land. Let me put it to you this way. There's a theology, and it's called the theology of the remnant, those left behind. Those people that are left behind to deal with the struggle and the heartache of, of an exiled nation. Those people left behind that have been doing wrong things are not yet negated because God is a God of the covenant. And that means when I say that, it's a third big idea for you before we even really jump in the text. God covenanted with the people of Israel that he would always be their God. That God would bless them and that through the world... God would bless the world through the nation of Israel. And anybody that cursed Israel, God would curse. Israel had a special election. And God was always going to be faithful to that covenant. God is faithful. And so now we, again, we pick up with Nehemiah. These are the words of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is in Susa. Susa is the capital of Babylon, not the capital of Israel. Please, let's understand that Nehemiah is, is in uh, enemy territory, trying to figure out how to be a godly person. He is a, a, a prophet that God's called up, and he's going to give him a special message and leadership to do among the people of Israel. But, but here we get the beginning of the story. Um, in, the, in the month of Kesleth, uh, just for your trivia knowledge, that's, that's, like, that's like saying like November, or, or like half of November and half of December. That, that, that's that, that month period of Kesleth. Um, and while he's at the citadel in Susa, his, now this uh, Hananiah, which could have been an actual brother, I personally like to believe that Hananiah was an actual brother, but it could have just been a brother of the faith. It could have been somebody of the Jewish nation. And so Hananiah um, and, and one, of, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men. Uh, some, and this is, this is unique here. It's, it's not so ambivalent as, oh, just some other men. It's more like, some men with an agenda. It's more like, more like they came with a purpose. And, and part of their purpose is to let Nehemiah know what's going on uh, in, among um, Israel and Jerusalem. Um, and so I questioned them about the Jewish remnant. Again, if I were a Bible writer, I would circle and underline that word remnant. Because if there's a few left behind, God can do something. Are you with me? If there's a few faithful a few still working, a few that still can hear from God, a few still trying and struggling in their faith. Revival can still come. And so there's this remnant that's left behind that, that, that he starts asking about that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. 
And so in verse 3, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. So uh, they're struggling. They're struggling physically. They're struggling spiritually. All right, if all of your leadership from your land is taken, it's going to be hard to live. And could, do, you, do you know how long this exile would last? 70 years. Can you imagine 70 years without any organized government helping to, to, to lead your land? Everybody just becomes wanderers. Man, don't we feel like wanderers today? Spiritually wandering around, praying that God will bring us revival, praying that He'll restore our souls. But not only are they troubled, not only have they're struggling, they're also disgraced. As in, um, they feel in some way abandoned. They feel like it's one thing to be struggling physically and spiritually, but they feel like, wow, God's supposed to be our God, and look what happened to us. But that's just the, the people. Let's, let's carry forward. Uh, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been a fire. So, so the physical appearance of Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, the physical appearance matched their spiritual condition. Have you ever noticed when that occurs? That our spirits, that our spiritual conditions will, also, will often affect our physical condition. That what's going on on the inside has an effect on the outside. So let's, Let's just take a moment and reverse the order. If you've got a spiritual problem that you can see played out in a physical way, then you probably need to address the physical problem that's really a spiritual problem in a spiritual way. See, we're trying to address a whole bunch of physical problems around us right now. But the real problem is spiritual. Are you with me? See, see, we, we want to blame other things or put our finger on this. And I've got my finger. I believe on what it is. Our problem is spiritual. And if we have a spiritual problem, then we need resolution in a spiritual way. And who resolves spiritual issues? God. Jesus Christ. The ultimate response to a spiritual problem. He came for us, died on a cross for us, rose again, uh, uh, excuse me, conquering all of death and providing new life. He's the ultimate resolution for any spiritual problem. I'm reminded today of the 12 steps of alcoholic, um, excuse me, uh, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Have you ever heard of those 12 steps before? I just want to read a few of them. But when I, before I read a few of them, I wanted to make a few pointed comments. I believe addiction is a disease. It is an actual physical problem. And, and once addiction gets a hold of our lives, it's, it's serious. It's just serious. And some of us have faced these. Some of us have faced these issues in our families. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. And we're not making light uh, of an addiction problem, nor are we making light of a wonderful 12-step program, but we want to highlight together that addiction is a physical problem, a disease. And let's listen to the way of, that AA resolves or, or goes about resolving their um, physical, the physical disease of addiction. And I just want to, I'm, I'm not going to read all 12 steps, but I'm going to read a few of them. Are you with me? The very first step, we admit we are powerless over alcohol and that our lives have become unmanageable. Very first step. Number two, we must come to believe uh, in a higher, excuse me, in a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. If you're like me, you're like, man, this sounds like we're on the right track. Physical problem that's really a spiritual problem that needs a spiritual resolution. But, but right now they're just highlighting it. They haven't even gotten specific yet. They're about to get specific. Made a decision to turn around our lives, uh, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. Amen. I mean, I'm just with that. You know, they've got a physical problem. Now they're going to claim out the only way they're going to be able to resolve it. And it's not in a 12 step program, it's in God. Uh, the fourth or, or some number step admit to God and to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. So we're going to bring our problems before God. Uh, we we uh, were entirely um, ready 
to have God remove all these defects of our character. Who, who does the, the healing work from addiction? God. Now, humbly ask Him to remove our shortcomings. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious uh, contact with God as we understand Him, praying only that uh, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Now, if you're if you're like me, you read. I mean, you can Google this yourself. You can Google the twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you're going to read the same thing that I just read. If we have a physical problem, it's really probably addressing a spiritual problem. And Jesus, Jesus has spiritual problems and physical problems in the palm of His hand. And maybe we start addressing the spiritual problem in the world around us in a spiritual way, and that way is Jesus Christ. Um, so, look at verse 4. Then I heard these things, and I sat down and wept. How does Nehemiah respond? Let's take a lesson from Nehemiah. He becomes grieved. Burdened. Burdened. Are you burdened over the state of the world today? Amen? Burdened over your state. I'm, I'm burdened over my state. But burdened over the, what, what's going on uh, around us in Lillington, in our church, in our community, and our friends. Yes, I'm burdened by that. Uh, we should be grieved by that. We, sh- we should be grieved today that, that if we walked out of the doors of this congregation in Harnett County, we're going to probably, excuse me, find 70% of its population still at home and disconnected with God. I'm grieved by that. But I, again, I'm going to go back to the first thing I said. I see a problem. It's physical. People are still in their homes. I'm going to address it in a spiritual way. I'm going to start praying about it. How does Nehemiah respond? He starts praying and fasting. Now, I, I, but both are, are, are dynamic things. If you've never fasted, um, first pray about fasting. <laughs> um, but be wise about how you fast. And fasting is, is in some way denying yourself something. A meal. A few meals. Um, you're denying yourself something. So that you might better hear from God. Praying. Humbling yourself so that you might hear from God. You remember the old saying, we're never stronger than when we are on our knees. So we've got a burden. So Nehemiah gives us a model of how to respond. Uh, If I'm going to respond in a spiritual way, my first place I'm going to go is to prayer. I'm reminded today of, of addressing our spiritual problem in a spiritual way with a prayer that my buddy Carol Marsalis wrote a little while ago. Let me read the prayer for you. Lord, we long and plead for your presence. We have failed you in so many ways. We confess that you are faithful. You are a God of compassion and restoration. Though we wander aimlessly through this world, we are comforted to know that you are by our sides. You have not deserted us. You have always shown through your grace and mercy that you are anxious to pour out your blessings and protection on us through your Son for your glory and our benefit. Lord, rekindle our flame and bathe us with holy fire for service in your kingdom. Inspire us and stir our hearts. We urgently seek to undergo new life in our dormant spiritual existence. We beseech your guidance, power, and love and restoring Renewing, revitalizing our commitments to the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to wake up to your word of truth and to carry forth the torch and spirit of revival in others. In the holy name of God, amen. If we have a spiritual problem, let's respond to it in a spiritual way. And it starts on our knees with prayers like ones that we were about to read in Nehemiah. But prayers like uh, Carol wrote for us. And so he starts this prayer. I mourned and fasted before the God of heaven. He doesn't go to his, his, his local uh, gossip group to try to get a figure out on how to resolve this problem. He doesn't start calling up neighbors and saying, hey, what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? He goes to the source. And starts to beseech the Lord. 
you know, it would probably behoove me to say in some way. Today, could we commit to bringing our problems to the Lord? Not 25 other people. Let's come to him first. And I trust that as we come to him, he's going to open doors. Whether they be in conversation or in seeing a doctor or in receiving care or in being revived. I trust that if we seek him first, he's going to open up the doors that provide the healing that he wants us to have. Lord, the God of heaven, this is the great and awesome God. So he starts off with, with a sense of adoration and acknowledging who God is. Okay? But then he cuts right, right to it and starts confessing. Okay? Uh, you know, Lord, we acknowledge you're the one who keeps a covenant. Remember, he's that covenantal God of love. And, and then not only do you, you keep your covenant, you keep your commandments. And, and we are supposed to be loving him and keeping his commandments. So in verse 6, let your ear be attentive. We're, we're, we're praying God... Continue with your faithfulness. Continue to be a person of covenant. Excuse me. And then as you continue in verse 6, I confess the sins we Israel. He doesn't even stop there. I mean, lowly Nehemiah, okay? One guy is confessing the sins of the nation. Sometimes we may feel like we need to do that too. I hear it come out in lots of different ways as we talk today about politics or COVID or, or whatever else the case may be. But we would recognize that our nation needs spiritual awakening. Amen. But Nehemiah doesn't stop just in recognizing this. He brings it personally to himself. Not only does he acknowledge it for the nation, but notice he brings it to himself. He says, you know, Lord, Lord I confess this as a nation. But not only for the nation, I include myself and my father's family. Because I believe that, that Nehemiah recognizes something practical. Revival starts with me. I believe Nehemiah recognizes, yes, I want spiritual renewal for a nation. Yes, I want, I want spiritual renewal for my, my people. But that starts today with me. I believe without a doubt, I believe without a doubt, that Nehemiah prays this prayer because he has this great expectation that God's going to bring revival. I believe that not only does he have this great expectation that God's going to bring revival, he has this great expectation that he's going to bring revival to himself, to Nehemiah. Nehemiah wakes up, I believe, every morning in this prayer expecting God to pour out His Holy Spirit in his life in a fresh and new way. Have you ever heard the statement, the cart before the horse? You know, hey, you know, be careful in planning your life out or planning something or, or, or whatever your issue is. You might have the cart before the horse. As in, it's either harder for a horse to push a cart or you've got things backwards. I'm going to go with we've got things backwards. But in this act, in, in this phrase, I believe that our relationship is the metaphor, our relationship with Jesus is the metaphor of the horse, and we're the cart. And sometimes we get out there with our lives, and we're going in front of our relationship with Jesus. And our relationship with Jesus is kind of pushing us from place to place to place. And, but we want spiritual revival. So I'm standing at the front of this cart, and the horse behind me is pushing me, and I'm going, Come on, bring us revival. Come on, snap to it. Come on, horse, let's go. But doesn't that really sound backwards? I'm kind of hollering at Jesus behind me now and my relationship. When maybe I need to get the cart back in order. Maybe I need to hitch my wagon back on to my relationship with Jesus Christ and follow. I acknowledge that God is awesome and that He is powerful. I acknowledge that He's covenantal and faithful to His covenant. I confess that I've sinned and my sin separates me from God. And I need to get some stuff back in order today. And I need to return to a vibrant relationship with Him. A few weeks ago in our midweek gathering, we talked about in Malachi chapter 3, the great principle of returning to God. Because if we return to God, He promises that He is faithful to return to us. 
and which is a really odd thing to say because God is omnipotent, omniscient and omnipresent. So God never moves. We're the ones that move. So maybe if we just turned around and returned to God, what we're going to find, He's exactly where He always said He would be. Spiritually caring, spiritually refreshing, providing leadership and hope. Maybe it's time today that I get my cart back in order and realize if it starts with me, I want revival. I, I want spiritual renewal. But I do believe, I really like, you know, his prayer. Uh, I believe that what we do in ourselves can affect our church, can affect our community, it can affect our world. Notice how Nehemiah continues praying. Remember, okay, so, so, so he's going to ask God to remember to be faithful, which God never forgets to be faithful. I like this prayer because when we, pl- when we pray, God promises, pray, pray God's promises, we're going to get God's answers to his promises. He promises to be faithful. Remember the instruction that you gave your servant. Remember that. But in verse 9, if you return. If you return. So not only are we going to acknowledge, not only are we going to confess, we're going to rededicate our lives to Jesus Christ. Now, when I was a teenager, I believed I needed to rededicate my life every single week. And I'm here to tell you I was right then and I've left something behind. Every Sunday we gather, I should be in a mood to rededicate my life to Jesus Christ. Every morning that I wake up uh, in in my quiet time, I should take on the frame of mind. Today, I want to rededicate my commitment to Jesus Christ. I believe that's how I get to stir the spirit of the joy of my salvation. I mean, look at me. I'm happy just talking about it. I get to wake up in the morning and say, yes, Father, today's your day. And I recommit my day. I rededicate. Yesterday, I messed up. But today's your day. That's recommitment. I I, I messed up, but I'm a returning. Because God is faithful to accept those who return back to Him. Look at the end of this chapter. Probably verse 11 is, is the one that stands out to me the most. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Now I'll tell you who this man is. It's Artaxerxes. He's the ruler of the Persian um, uh, nation. He, he takes uh, r- rule over um, after every, excuse me, after you know, Darius and Xerxes. And you, well, you get the idea. He, he's, he's leading the bad guy camp. Okay? And, and Nehemiah's got to go talk to that guy to go speak to his people. So let me put it to you this way. God's doing a revival work inside of Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah totally believes that revival work is going on inside of him. is calling him to spread that revival work to a people inside of Israel. So he's not going to stay in Susa. He's going back to Israel. I totally believe that the spiritual work of repentance, of returning to God, happens inside of me, can have an impact on my family. I totally believe that the personal revival that God takes me through can impact my community, my church, my, my, my nation, my world. In fact, I want to pray this kind of prayer that Nehemiah has. Dear Lord, dear Lord, you're doing something inside of me. So give me favor as I go out. Grant me success. And what you're doing inside of me, take it to other people. What you're doing inside of me, take it back to Israel. Take it back to my home. Take it back to my family. Have you ever skipped rocks in a pond before? You know, you try to go get the smoothest rock that you can, and you want to you skip it across. And it, to be fair, the coolest thing about skipping the rocks is not just the skipping of a rock and, and how many times you can make it. It's watching it skip. And how many, you know, it's, it's watching it hit the water. And you, when it hits the water, you know, it creates that little ripple effect. And then it goes a little bit further and, you know, it hits the water again and it creates. The, and so you're watching it. You're going, bing, bing. And every time, every time, a ripple effect. Maybe that's the way that we should be as believers. That rock that God is spiritually skipping across our world, our community, our nation. 
that every time, every time, I wonder. Let, let, let's, let's, let's let this make a mark today. I wonder if in our families and in our world, when we walk outside of the doors of our congregation today, the ripple effect will make people look back at Jesus Christ. That's revival. We want the ripple effect to make people look back at Jesus Christ. We want it in our lives today. As maybe we've come into contact with Christ and realize that we need to acknowledge Him. We need to confess before Him and we need to return back to Him. And allow the ripple effect of me doing that to affect just the water around me. And I trust that as it affects the water around me, it's just going to ripple out to where God wants it to be. Because our spiritual repentance, revival, restoration today can make a difference in the waters around us. Heavenly Father, we ask for your help today. And Father, you would bring us all to a place of personal repentance. We would confess our sin before you and return back to you. And Father, we would get serious about addressing our problems today in a spiritual way. Father, I confess that revival has to start with me. But Father, confess my sin before you. Ask for your forgiveness and commit to returning back to you. That may be a prayer that you need to pray today. Asking God for, your, for the forgiveness of your sin. That you might turn your life over to Him and return back to Him in a unique and special way that today we would rededicate ourselves before Him. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Let's respond to that. You might need to come forward and rededicate your life. or You might need just to come forward and make a confession of your faith. Let's respond to Him today.